A Summary and Interpretation of 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson Narrated and Interpreted by Alexander Sandalis Rule 12 and the last rule of Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life Pet a cat when you encounter one on the street This rule is going to discuss the limitation of being the necessity of suffering and why it's so critical in life and what we can essentially do about it. The idea that life is suffering is a tenet in one form or another of every major religious doctrine. Buddhists state it directly, Christians illustrate it with the cross, and Jews commemorate the suffering endured over centuries. Suffering is a component of being. It is the gateway, from my perspective, to true excellence in any vocational field. In fact, rather a vocational field in life, in the vocation of life. Suffering, voluntary or involuntary, is a necessity of being. And instead of pushing back against it, like I used to, I now welcome it and relish it. When suffering comes a knocking at my door, I have to tell myself amor fati, a Latin phrase meaning the love of fate. It's not merely to bear what is necessary, but embrace it and take it on and face exactly what's in front of you. And because we live in a culture and society, most of us in a Western modern world where involuntary suffering and pain is rare, because of the stable economic, geological, environmental state of our countries. Most of the world listening to this, people listening to this, can say that, right? Because the involuntary suffering is not present, such as when our parents and parents' parents, great-grandparents, for example, had to go through high rates of often child labor, so our great-grandparents, their generation, there was high rates of child labor. I uh, post about this on my Instagram if you want to read more about it. And that was involuntary. Our companies, industrial companies, came to poor families and they offered very little money, but they were desperate. So they took it and children of the ages of as young as six, all the way to teenage years, were working in factories all day, every day. Involuntary suffering. They did what they had to do to survive, to put food on the table, to keep a roof above their head. What do we do? Well, we've created good times for ourselves because bad times create hard men, but hard men become weak and then create bad times, soft times rather. So we have to create voluntary suffering for ourselves and this is something that can be encapsulated through physical Endurement, physical activity, whether it's a martial art, whether it's a going for running, weight training, even yoga, Pilates, these can be mentally, very emotionally, spiritually, very challenging. So this is how uh, many components of how we can create voluntary suffering for ourselves to push us, push through the mental limitations and barriers of our being to find new parts of ourselves. Now we're going to talk about the limitation of being. Imagine a being who is omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. What does such a being lack? Limitation. They lack limitation. If you're already everything, everywhere, always, there is nowhere to go and nothing to be. Everything that could be already is and everything that could happen already has. This idea helped Peterson deal with the terrible fragility of being, as he says here. But there's something to be said for recognizing that existence and limitation are inextricably linked. Though 30 spokes may form a wheel, it is the hole within the hub which gives the wheel utility. It is not the clay the potter throws which gives the pot its usefulness, but the space within the shape from which the pot is made. Without a door, 
The room cannot be entered, and without its windows, it is dark. Such is the utility of non-existence. Such is the utility of limitation, of space, of imperfection. And so, suffering, which is tied into the limitation of being, and pain, as well with that, is a beautiful thing. The worst pains and sufferings in your life, and it's so easy to say when you have good times, when things are going well, when you're healthy, when you're not sick, when things are relatively stable. It's so easy to say this. I'm very aware. That suffering is a blessing to us human beings. That limitation that we feel all this, all this emotion and turmoil, mentally, physically, emotionally. Is why we're not like gods. But it is also why we are like gods. Because we have consciousness and control and can... Plan, think, ponder, reflect, get better, progress, grow. So we need the limitation of being. Don't run from it. You know, a, a superhero, for example, that can do anything, turns out to be no hero at all. In fact, uh, one of the things that happened when they first was writing the DC Comics uh, S Superman in the 40s, they found that Superman became boring because... He could do anything. He could leap over buildings. He could fly faster than light. Super hearing, x-ray vision, freeze objects, uh, move entire planets. Nuclear blast didn't even phase him. And if he did get hurt somehow, he would immediately heal. He was omnipresent, omni omniscient, um, omnipotent. He became invulnerable. And so he became boring. So what did they do? They wrote in the comics, uh, Kryptonite. They created Kryptonite. This was Superman's weakness. Green Kryptonite. Green Kryptonite. Weakened Superman. Uh, it could even kill him in sufficient dosages. Red Kryptonite caused him to behave strangely. Red Green blend caused him to mutate. They created a dozen different Kryptonite variants. They made it more interesting. So why is a movie, why are these fantasy movies? Let's think about it. Instead of just blindly, unconsciously watching all these movies, let's think about why has the Marvel Universe been so popular? Why has it become the second highest grossing, a second highest grossing film of all time? And probably by the time you watch this, it may, as, may have well surpassed Avatar. Why are these movies able to capture us so much. That is a video and a whole lecture in of itself, but one part of it is because the characters they portray have a limit. They are not limitless. We know at a moment's notice every character we grow to love could be taken away like that. <laughs> For those who have seen that, I didn't do that on purpose. I didn't do that on purpose. But those who have seen the uh, Marvel movies know that's a perfect reference. That. All over. All done. All get taken away. And that keeps us mentally, emotionally, spiritually on the edge of our consciousness. Like a drug feeding us. Like, I want to know more. I want to see more. What's going to happen next? We are, we are like, they got us hook, line, and sinker. They've written great stories and they've written great characters that aren't unbeatable. They have limitation. Sometimes we know them, sometimes it's ambiguous, but they have limitation and then it's interesting, then it's engaging. And that is a part of a component that makes human beings and homo sapiens and the, 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 the being in itself interesting and fun and exciting because we are limitless. The maximum age of a human being caps out at about 120 to 130 right now in 2019. Do I hope we can come up with technology that can make us live longer and replace limbs and replace organs? Absolutely. That's just me though. I want to keep living. I want to see more life. But 
life is limited. Every single life is limited. It is a death, it is a birth, death cycle. And so with that, there's a sense of urgency. Because we are limited. And limitation creates a sense of urgency. Remembering, talking about a superhero that a superhero could do, anything turns out to be no hero at all. He's nothing specific, so he's nothing. He has nothing to strive against, so he can't be admirable. Being of any reasonable sort appears to require limitation. Perhaps this is because being requires becoming, perhaps as well as me, static existence. And to become is to become something more, or at least something different. That is only possible for something limited. Let's get darker. Can being itself, with its malarial mosquitoes, child soldiers, degenerative neurological diseases, genocides alike, truly be justified? I'm not sure I could have formulated a proper answer to such a question in the 19th century, before the totalitarian horrors of the 20th were monstrously perpetrated on millions of people. I don't know that it's possible to understand why such doubts are morally impermissible without the fact of the Holocaust and the Stalinist purges and Maoist catastrophic great leap forward. And I also don't think it is possible to answer the question by thinking. Thinking leads inexorably to the abyss. It does not work for Tolstoy, it might not have even worked for Nietzsche, who arguably thought more clearly about such things than anyone in history. So, you know, if it didn't work for Nietzsche, then we might have some problems. But if it is not thinking that can be relied upon in the, in the direst of situations, what is left? Thought, after all, is the highest of human achievement, is it not? Perhaps not. When existence reveals itself as ex existentially intolerable, Thinking collapses on of itself. In such situations, in the depths, it's noticing, not thinking, that does the trick. So it's noticing. Perhaps you might start by noticing this. When you love someone, it's not despite the limitations. It's because of the limitations. Of course, it's complicated. You don't have to be in love with every shortcoming and accept it. You shouldn't stop trying to make life better or let suffering just be. But there appears to be limits on the path to improvement beyond which we might not want to go. At least we sacrifice our humanity itself. Of course, it's one thing to say being requires limitation and then go about happily when the sun is shining, your father is free of Alzheimer's disease, and your kids are healthy, and your marriage is happy. But when things go wrong? That is the hardest time to say, well, it's time to embrace suffering and the limitation of being. It's so easy for me to say right now, even though every person, including myself, is, is, is battling demons that no one, almost no one knows anything about. But for the most part, we're okay. But there's many people who are not. They'll be okay, but right now they're suffering immensely. And so can those people say, when things are going wrong, when things are going the worst, can they say, well, you know what? Being is limited. This is what it means to be a human being. I must persevere. That's the hardest thing to do. But it's so important. You, you need to. But what happens when you have a crisis in your life, interpersonally with other people or within yourself? Peterson lays out here a multi-step process questions that you can ask yourself to get through it that I think is so practical because I think a lot of the times we lose practicality in a lot of the minutia of ideas and so I really want to emphasize the practicality of these ideas and highlight them so people and myself can take it and use it number one when you're dealing with a crisis here's what you can do set aside some time to talk and think about the illness or the crisis and how it should be managed every day because Peterson's example he was dealing with uh, medical serious medical issues with his daughter Michaela so we set aside some time to think and ponder about how to deal with this do not talk or think about it otherwise if you do not limit its effect you will become exhausted and everything will spiral into the ground so this is to say we can't talk about this all day we can't let this consume us, this crisis and problem. We must set aside time. Hey, we're gonna talk, we need to talk about this. 
after work at this time. I don't want to let this consume us, but we need to set aside time instead of letting it fester beneath us throughout our days. So we can conserve our strength because we're in a war when we're in a crisis with ourselves or other people. Not a battle. A war is composed of many battles. You must stay functional through all of them. When worries associated with the crisis arise at other times, remind yourself that you will think them through during the scheduled period. This is number two. Put aside those mental uh, cr uh, problems that, that, that arise within yourself. Write them down if it's helpful. We'll talk about it here in the allotted time. The parts of your brain that generate anxiety are more interested in the fact that there is a plan than in the details of the plan. Don't schedule your time to think in the evening or at night, then you won't be able to sleep. If you can't sleep, then everything will go rapidly downhill. And Dr. Matthew Walker, uh, foremost expert on sleep, I would highly, highly recommend you guys as a resource if you care about sleep, which you should be, you should do, because you spend a third of your life doing it and it underpins every single biological body system of a human being and of, 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 of a species, of animal species. Number three, shift the unit of time you use to frame your life. When the sun is shining and times are good and the, and the crops are bountiful, you can make your plans for the next month and the next year and the next five years. You can even dream a decade ahead, but you can't do that when your leg is clamped firmly in the crocodile's jaws. You can't do that when you just got diagnosed with cancer, when you just got into a car accident, your mother just got into a car accident, when your father just died or your best friend just died. Because you will be going through a, a tremendous amount of grief and, and, and terror within your soul and heart, right? So you have to get past that to give yourself some space where you can plan ahead. So when the crops are bountiful and times are good and the sun is shining like it is now, that's the time to plan. And so, what is that for you? Is that a monthly plan where you review and reflect upon your month? Is that a daily meditation and mindfulness practice for you? Is that writing a, a weekly journal or diary or whatever it is for you? Is it asking a series of questions periodically? Is it setting specific goals and plans with times and dates? Whatever it is for you, implement it. When times are good, because times are not always good. Otherwise, we wouldn't have good times. They'd just be times. Aim high like Pinocchio's Geppetto. Wish upon a star and then act properly in accordance with that aim. Once you are aligned with the heavens, you can concentrate on the day. Be careful. Put things you can control in order. Repair what is in disorder and make what is already good better. It is possible that you can manage if you're careful. People are very tough. People, we are. We are very tough. We can survive through much pain and loss. Look through history, you can see. You're dealing with the problem now. People with less resources than you, much less resources than you, have done more than what you have done with what you have had. People with less than what you have had now have done more. Think about that. People could survive through much pain and loss, but to, but to persevere, they must see the good in being. They must have this optimistic, non-nihilistic perspective. If you don't, then you drown. You drown in the, in the horrors of your own nihilism, pessimism, and darkness. And you're lost then. So pet a cat when you encounter it on the street. How does that even apply to any of the stuff that's been discussed thus far? Here's what it means. It's a little extra light on a good day and a tiny respite on a bad day. If you pay careful attention even on a bad day, you may be fortunate enough to be confronted with small opportunities of just that sort. That's what petting a cat when you encounter one means. Instead of rejecting it, instead of rejecting light, maybe your version of that, you'll see a little girl dancing on the street because she's all dressed up in a ballet costume. And you'll smile because it's a little bit of light. It's a little bit of hope. A little bit of child innocence that we all kind of wish or probably should have a little bit more of sometimes. Maybe you'll have a particularly good cup of coffee in the cafe that cares about their customers. And you'll just take a moment to just breathe and wait, this is actually pretty good. Huh. I'm enjoying this. And just take a couple of moments. 
Maybe you can steal 10 to 20 minutes to do some ridiculous thing that distracts you, distracts you or reminds, that you can, it reminds you that you can laugh at the absurdity of exi existence. And for Peterson, that's watching The Simpsons. For some people, that's watching other television, entertainment, movies. They're escaping from the world. I have my own version of that, and I've realized I need it. I love it. Because I'm not just here on this planet. I'm not just here in this life just to do this, just to be serious, just to just to get better, just to just to David Goggins my life. I'm not just here for that. I'm here. I want to enjoy some stuff. I want to enjoy some good food. I want to enjoy some good company, good people. And have a laugh and sit back and breathe for a couple of moments. But only when I earn it. I must earn it. Not sloth around. Just living in a gluttonous state of pleasure. No. It's just moments. Taking moments to breathe. Let a little light in. And pet a cat when you encounter it on the street. And maybe when you're going for a walk and your head is spinning and a cat will show up. Or a dog will show up. And if you pay attention... And you remind yourself, just the 15 seconds, that the wonder of being might make up for the suffering that accompanies it. So pet a cat when you encounter one on the street. That's where we'll end. By letting in a bit of extra light every day with the glimmers and moments and sparks of life. If we allow ourselves to see it. That's it. 12 rules for life. I spent... Over the last year, diving deep, trying to analyze and dissect this book so I can understand and improve and assist other people in their own journey. And it's probably been one of the most valuable books I've ever read and dissected. And if you want to buy it, the link's below because I'd highly recommend it because there's a lot I cannot cover here. If you watch them all or if you just watched one, I just need to say thank you. Because it's support. You know, I've spent thousands of dollars, hundreds of hours, so much energy and time. And I think, I don't have to do this. I could just read the books, highlight them as I do, and then leave it at that. But there's something that pulls me back when I when I when I'm capsulate, when I'm when I'm enchanted by these, these amazing, uh, life-altering ideas and people like Peterson and Robert Greene and etc, etc. And I'm, I'm just taken aback and I'm like, I feel, I feel like it's almost a duty, a duty for me to go deeper because we appear to live in a world that is so the opposite, where people just gloss over the facts, they headline read. I don't go deep into subjects. So in fact, I'd rather master a couple of dozen really good books and go deep on, really deep on a couple of them like this and spend a lot of time on them and let them, those form the tenets and principles and axioms of my being than say I read a thousand books or a hundred books a year, whatever it is. It's like people are just consuming information for the sake of it, and I've been there. I'm trying to take a step away back from it. 12 Rules for Life. I've finally finished dissecting and analyzing every single rule. I think the uh, if you guys prefer to listen to this on audio format, and you want to go back, or on Spotify and iTunes and all audio platforms, where you can listen to podcasts, just type my name in, and you can listen to it for free. And if you feel obliged or want to support what I've done, and feel like, hey, this person's done, I like what this person's done, and I'd like to support it uh, financially, then there's links in the description. But I'd, it's okay if you don't. Um, I'm absolutely not asking. But the option's there if you feel like you need to, because some people do ask me. Thank you for watching. If you're curious, there's uh, other books I've summarized. And if you've made it this far, Robert Greene's 48 Laws of Power is also one of the most powerful books I've ever read. I've, I've analyzed every single law, 40, oh, 48 Laws. Uh, I've got How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Uh, these three books right here are some of the most profound and impactful. Um, and as many have asked, 
I will eventually be reading uh, Robert Greene's Laws of Human Nature. We will see whether I do that. People who ask me to review certain books, I do not take requests. If you have to understand, it's a lot of money, a lot of time, and a lot of energy. If you want me to do a book, you have to invest in it. You have to hire me. Otherwise, there's no point asking. I will do books that I want to do. Um, that are a right to invest hundreds of hours of my time into. However, there will be one more video on 12 Rules for Life. Uh, in the next one I will post, it will be the, about the hardest questions we're not asking ourselves. Because Peterson finishes with uh, the last chapter called Coda. And this is, this is what I think is to be one of the most practical parts of this book. So there is one more component. But it is up post 12 Rules for Life. And stay tuned for that. Yeah, that will be already up most likely by the time you're watching this. Thank you so every single one of you who have uh, joined me on this uh, journey to becoming a little more enlightened, a little better, a little less malevolent, a little more aware of our malevolence and capacities for good and evil. Let me know uh, your most impactful rule that has impacted you the most and or lesson from this book and what Peterson or I have shown you or demonstrated to you that, that you didn't realize before that you've found quite powerful and impactful. Let me know below and thank you. 12 Rules for Life, Jordan Peterson. Analysis. Done.